It was the exact kind of abode that I had been looking for for weeks, for I was in that condition of mind when absolute renunciation of society was a necessity. I had become diffident of myself and wearied of my kind. A strange unrest was in my blood, a barren dearth in my brains. Familiar objects and faces had grown distasteful to me. I wanted to be alone. This is the mood which comes upon every sensitive and artistic mind when the possessor has been overworked or living too long in one groove. It is nature's hint for him to seek pastures new, the sign that a retreat has become needful. If he does not yield, he breaks down and becomes whimsical, hypochondriacal, as well as hypocritical. It is always a bad sign when a man becomes overcritical and censorious about his own or other people's work, for it means that he is losing the vital portions of work freshness and enthusiasm. Before I arrived at the dismal stage of criticism, I hastily packed up my knapsack, and taking the train to Westmoreland, I began my tramp in search of solitude, bracing air, and romantic surroundings. Many places I came upon during that early summer wandering that appeared to have almost the required conditions yet some petty drawback prevented me from deciding. Sometimes it was the scenery that I did not take kindly to. At other places, I took sudden antipathies to the landlady or landlord and felt I would abhor them before a week was spent under their charge. Other places which might have suited me, I could not have as they did not want a lodger. Fate was driving me to this cottage on the moor, and no one can resist destiny. One day, I found myself on a wide, pathless moor near the sea. I had slept the night before at a small hamlet, but that was already eight miles in my rear, and since I had turned my back upon it, I had not seen any signs of humanity. I was alone, with a fair sky above me, a balmy ozone-filled wind blowing over the stony and heather-clad mounds, and nothing to disturb my meditations. How far the moor stretched, I had no knowledge. I only knew that by keeping in a straight line, I would come to the ocean cliffs, then perhaps after a time, arrive at some fishing village. I had provisions in my knapsack, and being young, I did not fear a night under the stars. I was inhaling the delicious summer air, and once more getting back the vigor and happiness I had lost. My city-dried brains were again becoming juicy. Thus, hour after hour slid past me, with the paces, until I had covered about fifteen miles since morning, when I saw before me in the distance, a solitary stone-built cottage with a roughly slated roof. I'll camp there if possible, I said to myself as I quickened my steps towards it. To one in search of a quiet, free life, nothing could have possibly been more suitable than this cottage. It stood on the edge of lofty cliffs, with its front door facing the moor, and the backyard wall overlooking the ocean. The sound of dancing waves struck upon my ears like a lullaby as I drew near. How they would thunder when the autumn gales came on, 
and the seabirds fled, shrieking to the shelter of the sedges. A small garden spread in front, surrounded by a dry stone wall, just high enough for one to lean lazily upon when inclined. This garden was a flame of color, scarlet predominating, with those other softer shades that cultivated poppies take on in their blooming, for this was all that the garden grew. As I approached, taking note of this singular assortment of poppies and the orderly cleanness of the windows, the front door opened and a woman appeared who impressed me at once favorably as she leisurely came along the pathway to the gate and drew it back as if to welcome me. She was of middle age and when young must have been remarkably good looking. She was tall and still shapely with a smooth clear skin, regular features and a calm expression that at once gave me a sensation of rest. To my inquiries, she said that she could give me both a sitting and bedroom and invited me inside to see them. As I looked at her smooth black hair and cool brown eyes, I felt that I would not be too particular about the accommodation. With such a landlady, I was sure to find what I was after here. The rooms surpassed my expectation dainty white curtains and bedding with the perfume of lavender about them, a sitting room, homely yet cozy without being crowded. With a sigh of infinite relief, I flung down my knapsack and clenched the bargain. She was a widow with one daughter whom I did not see the first day, as she was unwell and confined to her own room but the next day she was somewhat better, and then we met. The fare was simple, yet it suited me exactly for the time. Delicious milk and butter with homemade scones, fresh eggs and bacon. After a hearty tea, I went to bed in a condition of perfect content with my quarters. Yet happy and tired out as I was, I had by no means a comfortable night. This I put down to the strange bed. I slept certainly, but my sleep was filled with dreams so that I woke late and unrefreshed. A good walk on the moor, however, restored me and I returned with a fine appetite for breakfast. Certain conditions of mind with aggravating circumstances are required before even a young man can fall in love at first sight, as Shakespeare had shown in his Romeo and Juliet. In the city where many fair faces passed me every hour, I had remained like a stoic. Yet no sooner did I enter the cottage after that morning walk than I succumbed instantly before the weird charms of my landlady's daughter, Ariadne Brunel. She was somewhat better this morning and able to meet me at breakfast, for we had had our meals together while I was their lodger. Ariadne was not beautiful in the strictly classical sense, her complexion being too lividly white and her expression too set to be quite pleasant at first sight. Yet, as her mother had informed me, she had been ill for some time, which accounted for that defect. Her features were not regular, her hair and eyes seemed to be too black with that strangely white skin, and her lips too red for any except the decent harmonies of an Aubrey Beardsley. Yet my fantastic dreams of the preceding night, with my morning walk, had prepared me to be enthralled by this modern poster-like invalid. The loneliness of the moor, with the singing of the ocean, had gripped my heart with a wistful longing. The incongruity of those flaunting and evanescent poppy flowers, dashing the giddy tints in the face of that sober hearth, touched me with a shiver as I approached the cottage. And lastly, that weird embodiment 
of startling contrasts completed my subjugation. She rose from her chair as her mother introduced her and smiled while she held out her hand. I clasped that soft snowflake, and as I did so, a faint thrill tingled over me and rested on my heart, stopping for the moment its beating. This contrast seemed also to have affected her as it did me. A clear flush, like a white flame, lighted up her face, so that it glowed as if an alabaster lamp had been lit. Her black eyes became softer and more humid as our glances crossed, and her scarlet lips grew moist. She was a living woman now, while before she had seemed half a corpse. She permitted her white, slender hand to remain in mine longer than most people do at an introduction, and then she slowly withdrew it, still regarding me with steadfast eyes for a second or two afterwards. Fathomless, velvety eyes those were, yet before they were shifted from mine, They appeared to have absorbed all my willpower and made me her abject slave. They looked like deep, dark pools of clear water, yet they filled me with fire and deprived me of strength. I sank into my chair almost as languidly as I had risen from my bed that morning. Yet I made a good breakfast, and although she hardly tasted anything, This strange girl rose much refreshed, and with a slight glow of color in her cheeks, which improved her so greatly that she appeared younger and almost beautiful. I had come here seeking solitude, but since I had seen Ariadne, it seemed as if I had come for her only. She was not very lively. Indeed, thinking back, I cannot recall any spontaneous remark of hers. She answered my questions by monosyllables and left me to lead in words. Yet she was so insinuating and appeared to lead my thoughts in her direction and speak to me with her eyes. I cannot describe her minutely. I only know that from the first glance and touch she gave me, I was bewitched and could think of nothing else. It was a rapid, distracting, and devouring infatuation that possessed me. All night long, I followed her about like a dog. Every night I dreamed of that white, glowing face, those steadfast black eyes, those moist, scarlet lips, and each morning I rose more languid than I had been the day before. Sometimes I dreamt she was kissing me with those red lips, while I shivered at the contact of her silky black tresses as they covered my throat. Sometimes that we were floating in the air, her arms about me, and her long hair enveloping us both like an inky cloud, while I lay supine and helpless. She went with me after breakfast on that first day to the moor, and before we came back, I had spoken my love and received her assent. I held her in my arms and had taken her kisses in answer to mine, nor did I think it strange that all this had happened so quickly. She was mine, or rather, I was hers, without a pause. I told her it was fate that had sent me to her, for I had no doubts about my love, and she replied, that I had restored her to life. Acting upon Ariadne's advice, and also from natural shyness, I did not inform her mother how quickly matters had progressed between us. Yet, although we both acted as circumspectly as possible, I had no doubt that Miss Brunnell could see how engrossed we were in each other. Lovers are not unlike ostriches in their modes of concealment, I was not afraid of asking Miss Brunnell for her daughter, for she had already showed her partiality towards me and had bestowed upon me 
some confidence regarding her own position in life, and I knew, therefore, that so far as social position was concerned, there could be no real objection to our marriage. They lived in this lonely spot for the sake of their health and kept no servant because they could not get any to take service so far away from other humanity. My coming had been opportune and welcome to both mother and daughter. For the sake of decorum, however, I resolved to delay my confession for a week or two and trust to some favorable opportunity of doing it discreetly. Meantime, Ariadne and I passed our time in a thoroughly idle and lotus-eating style. Each night, I retired to bed meditating starting work next day. Each morning, I rose languid from those disturbing dreams, with no thought of anything outside my love. She grew stronger every day, while I appeared to be taking her place as the invalid. Yet I was more frantically in love than ever, and only happy when with her. She was my lone star, my only joy, my life. We did not go for great distances, for I liked best to lie on the dry heath and watch her glowing face and intense eyes while I listened to the surging of the distant waves. It was love made me lazy, I thought, for unless a man has all he longs for beside him, he is apt to copy the domestic cat and bask in the sunshine. I had been enchanted quickly. My disenchantment came as rapidly, although it was long before the poison left my blood. One night, about a couple of weeks after my coming to the cottage, I returned after a delicious moonlit walk with Ariadne. The night was warm, and the moon at the full, and therefore I left my bedroom window open to let in what little air there was. I was more than usually fagged out, so I had only strength enough to remove my boots and coat before I flung myself wearily on the coverlet and fell almost instantly asleep without tasting the nightcap draught that was constantly placed on the table and which I had always drained thirstily. I had a ghastly dream that night. I thought I saw a monster bat with the face and tresses of Ariadne fly into the open window and fasten its white teeth and scarlet lips on my arm. I tried to beat the horror away, but could not, for I seemed chained down and thralled also with drowsy delight as the beast sucked my blood with a gruesome rapture. I looked out dreamily and saw a line of dead bodies of young men lying on the floor, each with a red mark on their arms, on the same part where the vampire was then sucking me. And I remembered, having seen and wondered at such a mark on my own arm for the past fortnight. In a flash, I understood the reason for my strange weakness, and at the same moment, a sudden prick of pain roused me from my dreamy pleasure. The vampire, in her eagerness, had bitten a little too deeply that night, unaware that I had not tasted the drug draught. As I woke, I saw her fully revealed by the midnight moon, with her black tresses flowing loosely and with her red lips glued to my arm. With a shriek of horror, I dashed her backwards, getting one last glimpse of her savage eyes, glowing white face and blood-stained red lips. Then I rushed out into the night, moved on by my fear and hatred. Nor did I pause in my mad flight until I had left miles between me and that accursed cottage on the moor. <laughs>